like to, to thank everyone for coming to join us to talk about the electricity system. As a power engineer, uh, this is like a dream come true. I mean, I, you know, 10 years ago, to, to get this many people in a room of, of diverse uh, backgrounds to talk about electricity was sort of like you know, trying to get them all to go to the dentist at the same time. Almost impossible. So it's really exciting to be at a place where we can all talk about a really important topic um, from lots of different perspectives. And I really thank that San Diego National Lab and our congressional delegation and uh, bringing us all together in this room. All right, so what I want to talk about is a little bit, a few ideas uh, that would may help us build a smarter smart grid. So we're kind of building out the infrastructure of the smart grid, but now we need to actually give it the intelligence that will make it work for consumers. And so uh, we know that there's a lot of benefits. We've already talked about benefits of smart grid. One of the things that we're really facing, and uh, our panel's already kind of addressed this to some extent, people are, are a little bit nervous about that. So here's a, a, a couple of quotes I actually just pulled from Google News yesterday. Um, so this is just yesterday's news. Uh, Blue Water Power, bracing smart meter complaints. Uh, smart meters, what's the payoff for customers? Illinois governor threatens to veto smart grid le legislation. Uh, smart meters not hacker proof. Again, that's security from LA. Some owner owners refusing smart meters over health concerns. People have a lot of concern about the smart grid, and in order to make this work, we need to figure out how to address these. And so, I'm going to talk about three, different, four different things that I think we need to address in order to make smart grid work, both technologically and in terms of uh, consumer behavior adoption. First of all, I think. Most importantly, we need to figure out how to demonstrate that the smart grid has value for the consumer. And I think value needs to be really quantified carefully and um, put in terms that people really care about. People care about the cost of their electricity, they care about the reliability of the home while way out in the country, and they care about the environment. And so we need to demonstrate in uh, the near term that these meters have real value for customers. Secondly, we need to make sure that, that privacy concerns are addressed. Um, the, the amount of data we're going now from taking one measurement from people once a month to taking 15 measurement or, or one measurement every 15 minutes or maybe even five minutes. And so now we're learning as a utility, the utility industry, we're learning a lot more about what consumers do when they're home during the day. We need to make sure that that data, data is kept private in order to win over the public. Uh, thirdly, security. So, uh, we've heard about security. If, if bad guys come into the system and begin taking out the power grid because we built a smart grid, that's going to cause us a lot of problems. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about scalability. So when we des de design this uh, the smart grid, I'm going to build on what uh, 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 Marjorie Tetro uh, introduced in, the, in designing it organically. The body works well because it's not all of it relying on one particular part. Each part has its function. Um, Okay, and as since I am the token engineer on the panel, I'm going to talk about three different technologies uh, and of the smart grid. First is the phaser measurement unit, and the phaser measurement unit is a, is a device that's going to take uh, measurements from substations, those are the ugly things with fences around them and transmission lines coming in and out. Instead of taking one, one measurement maybe every 30 seconds or so, it'll be taking 30, sec 30 measurements every second. And it, it, it increases the amount of data that the grid operators get by order, several orders of magnitude. And so now the operators will be able to see in real time what's happening in their system. However, that's only true if we can actually process the data. Uh, secondly, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we can do by controlling the resources that we have a little bit better, controlling the generators, controlling energy storage, and, and then finally load. And then leading into talking about demand response, uh, using the smart meter to interact with the, the things that actually consume electricity, like air conditioners and electric vehicles. Okay, so the phaser measurement unit, as I mentioned, is, is now increasing the operator data from 2 readings per minute to 30 readings per second. So for a, for a grid operator, this means that, that he's, uh, he or she sitting on the operating floor, room floor will have hundreds of kilobytes or hundreds of megabytes of data coming in every second and then they have to process in a meaningful way, which is a real challenge. So the, what we need to do with the data in order to, to create value out of this is to develop algorithms uh, that can turn data into actual useful information uh, that the operators can act on to make our electricity system more reliable, 
reliable, so that when the storm is coming through, they can actually see what's happening, make better decisions, and actually keep the lights on for customers that are way out in the country. So we're working with the Department of Energy on a project in which we're developing a, 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 a sort of a real-time energy stress meter that will tell, tell grid operators what is uh, the risk of small blackouts, medium blackouts, and large blackouts in real time, and, and so that operators can make better decisions. Um, so this is just an example of some work we're doing. I'm, I'm not going to go into the, all the details about this, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Uh, so here's a model that we've developed of, of a blackout happening, and as I increase the stress in the system on the top graph, you kind of see that the voltages of the left is it, uh, the blue line is the voltage, the voltage kind of goes down. Um, but what's interesting is actually the system processes noise differently as it becomes more and more stressed. And what we're finding is that if we can measure how the system is processing the noise, uh, we would, can actually predict when the blackout will happen, or give the operators warning before the blackout happens. And so in the middle graph, you kind of see this change in, that's actually the frequency spectrum. It's data that be in the, in the old system with one measurement every 30 seconds or so, uh, grid operators would have no ability to see this. But now, with this high frequency measurement, grid operators will be able to see this, the, these changes and make decisions, but only if we provide them the tools to do this. So this research partnership hopefully will allow us to do this. Um, another thing that, that is, is kind of in the, in the process is trying to develop algorithms to uh, mitigate blackouts, uh, to avoid the sort of problems that, like what we had in August 2003 where New York City, a problem <laughs> with some trees in Ohio ended up with uh, Toronto, New York City, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Cleveland, all these major U.S. and Canadian cities uh, losing power. One of the real challenges is that um, if you look at the number of blackouts that we have per year, uh, here's just data from the from North American Electric Liability Corporation, and uh, if you look at how many blackouts we have per year, uh, despite our the enormous amount of innovation that's gone in, gone into the electricity industry, we're not reducing the frequency of blackouts. If you look at the uh, uh, rail, or particularly if you look at, for example, uh, any other industry, cell phones, uh, airlines, reliability is going up really substantially. In electricity, we're not doing better. So we need to do better. We need new technology to do this. Um, one of the challenges is that wind and solar are adding more noise to the system. So now as we're uh, injecting new sources of energy that come and go with the wind and, and the sun, uh, we're going to have, this problem is going to be all that more difficult, and so we need better technology to enable uh, the smart grid, or the, the power grid, to, to remain reliable when that new those new sources come online. Okay, so technology can help um, because of the smart grid it will enable connections to power plants, uh, to storage devices, so I toured recently a 15 megawatt battery down in Massachusetts. This is a battery that's the size of a truck the truck trailer that utilities can use, place it on the, on the wind and intermit, uh, mitigate the intermittency of wind. Um, and so A123 is the company that's producing that sort of stuff. Uh, and also we can actually control the load better. And so this is, as problems emerge, we can turn off an air conditioner or electric vehicle charging and, and uh, mitigate the, the consequences of a large blackout. So this is just a, an eye chart here, but uh, we're developing some technology here at UVM in order to, to have, instead of having a single operator in Washington, D.C. that has omniscient control over everything, let's, let's make this, the power grid a little bit more like the human body, where you have some intelligence in your brain, but you also have this intelligence distributed throughout your entire body, where all the pieces of your body are working to solve the problem. And so in this diagram, I'm, I'm kind of illustrating how we've got little control agents distributed throughout the network trying to uh, work together to come up with solutions as problems emerge. Um, all right, so uh, can that actually work is sort of the natural problem. Well, one of the things that we've done in our research here is, uh, is to go look to biology, because biological systems are able to solve enormously complex systems, uh, complex problems with limited resources. And so we actually, this is a picture of some vampire bats. You might not think of vampire bats as very nice animals, but they're actually very cooperative in the way that they, uh, they uh, help each other in in their communities. And so we were able to build a model in which we put, placed a little control agent kind of model, modeled after vampire bats, 
and they're cooperating with one another to control blackheads. And what we found is that without this type of control, we would get on average 33% uh, or 30 size uh, blackouts that were of 33% when we stressed the system. Um, as we increase the amount of cooperation among the pieces of the grid, so here on the, on the orange, uh, orange bars, you're seeing the in amount of cooperation among the pieces of the grid increasing. As we do so, uh, uh, the sizes of the blackouts decrease really dramatically. And uh, on the other hand, though, the communication requirements increase. So the more people are cooperating, the more the pieces of the grid are cooperating, the more the pieces have to talk with one another. Um, okay, so real-time control, I think, has substantial value, um, but we'll need, because, uh, because it, we can mitigate blackouts. I think that's a national security concern. It's also a concern in terms of uh, integrating large-scale wind and solar. Uh, we have to keep customer data private. Uh, I think one of the nice things about decentralizing the control system is that if the pieces are deciding, then we're less likely uh, to have a central attack, attack on a central system take the whole grid down. And then finally, uh, decentralized methods are more scalable. If, if you add a piece to the system, you don't have to upgrade the big giant central computer. You can just allow the pieces to cooperate with one another. Um, okay, I'm just really going to quickly talk about uh, demand response. There's been a lot of work on demand response, and that shows that it's beneficial to consumers if we have demand response customers that respond to changing prices. Um, it, 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 it definitely transfers wealth from generators to consumers. It also has some benefits in terms of CN2. Just plain old uh, having people respond to prices will allow us to uh, reduce the CO2 footprint to the electric grid. Uh, however, uh, so we know that we can control load with smart grid. We can send signals to the, to the air conditioners and the plug-in cars to turn them on and off, but should we? And I think this is where we kind of come back to the social uh, social questions. Uh, if load is controllable, uh, now all of a sudden bad guys can tr control the load also, or at least potentially. So that needs to be very carefully considered. Um, privacy. If all of a sudden consumers have to give up their, their air conditioner temperature preferences to the utility, is that sort of information going to be kept private? And I think that's something that people are legitimately concerned about. And so it's a concern that we need to address. Um, I think another problem is scalability. If we're treating every single load the same way uh, that we treat uh, a generator with complex control, we're going to have a lot of trouble uh, maintaining that as, as systems get bigger. And then finally, sort of, what is it for me? Um, I, I, these are kind of my what, what, what should we do about it uh, thoughts. Uh, I think we need to sort of gradually increase the ability of the smart grid. But, but be a little bit careful as we do it. We don't want to give the meters so much the capability that if there is a security breach, um, <laughs> bad guys are able to do bad things to the power grid because the power grid is essential to modern life. Um, and I think we need to de gradually deploy, rather than control loads, we need to deploy incentives so that, uh, that give people the opportunity to save real money by participating in the, uh, the electricity industry. So instead of uh, saying we're going to control your load, say we, we're going to give you the opportunity to participate in making the grid smarter and give people, compensate people for doing it. Um, I think it also needs to be designed so that, uh, so that people can just turn it on and ignore it. And you know, most people really don't want to think about this. Maybe a few people do, nerdy people like me. Uh, but most people want to just sort of turn on whatever technology we give them and ignore it. Um, and I think we should really avoid the direct load control approach um, <laughs> unless customers sign up for it and they're fairly compensated for it. And I think finally demonstrating value to customers is, is really essential and I think that's something that we really need to work on here in Vermont. Um, I, just this evening get to go to, the, to a, you know, uh, a local meeting in which people are going to express concerns about uh, the, the Burlington Smart Grid. So I think it, it, um, demonstrating value is going to be really important. Thanks.